Angel Lynn, author of two LA Times bestselling novels, Helen of Pasadena and Elizabeth the First Wife. Now comes the third book, The Sweeney Sisters, that you can purchase beginning April 28th at bookshop.org or a lot of other places that are on your website, right, Leanne? Yes, yeah. Your I mean, website looks so beautiful. Thank I love you. This. Thank you. I just redid it. I'm really happy with it. Yeah, it's gorgeous. I love that navy background to match your book cover. It's you're my also, color. It's my you're color. also a regular um, humor columnist for Pasadena Magazine. Mm -hmm. You've written monthly columns for O, the Oprah Magazine, as well as Working Mother Magazine. And she has also written for TV, radio, and many websites. Lynn is the producer and host of Satellite Sisters, the award-winning talk show she created with her four real sisters. Satellite Sisters began life as a syndicated radio show and now is a top-rated podcast for women. And it is so great. I was listening to it this morning. But what I love even more is that because of Satellite Sisters came a book called You're the Best, a celebration of friendship. And I just found that last night, bought it on Amazon. Oh! Can you show us a cover of it? Yes! I have I, one I, here. Oh, it looks so beautiful. I can't believe I didn't know about this book. Can you like flip through the pages real quick? Yeah, yeah, it's just, it's a, you know, it's a gift book about the importance of female friendship in our lives. So right. it's short essays, it's lists, it's, observations it's fun and it's easy to read but there's some really poignant um essays in here it came out in 2015 and i did a lot of speaking around the book um, because people want to talk about friendship you know women love their friends their friends are what give sort of value and a connection yes. in their lives and um and so I was out and about, Julie. I guess I guess I didn't I didn't cross paths with you, but um, what's kind of cool about the book? So it's written by my my four sisters, and I wrote it. Um, but also we have contributors, uh, our nieces, our daughters, our daughters-in-law. So there are voices um, from 16 to 60 represented in the book, which is cool. And so uh, amazing. Yeah because I started to sort of try to remember like what it was like to give birth and, and not have any friends. And I couldn't remember that long ago. <laughs> it's, so. yeah, it was a tough time. I mean, I remember, I don't know if you went to parent ed, but parent ed was a saving grace for me to like make friends in those beginning years of motherhood when my friends from the past hadn't had kids yet. Right, right. Yeah. No, I know. Yeah, I didn't know anyone. I, I moved to Pasadena to get married and had a baby. I didn't know one person. So uh, I would just wander around my neighborhood with my dog and my baby. Pushing and, and, a stroller, uh, hoping that somebody else with a stroller would walk by and want to be friends, right? It's true. And one day it happened. A woman yeah. walked out on her front porch. She's like, I just had a baby. You just had a baby. She didn't know anyone either. My friend Danielle. We're still friends. <laughs> That's so wonderful. And then, and then Helen of Pasadena was born. So tell right. us about that. Tell us about how your first novel came about. Because first of all, Satellite Sisters is celebrating its 20th anniversary this year, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, so we've been doing that show for a long time long time uh we you know and i love doing satellite sisters it's great so we were on the we were on uh, the radio for about 10 years we started on public radio and then we moved to abc radio and at one point we were on six days a week three hours a day of live radio so just wow. a, a lot six of talk a week hold on six days a week three hours of live radio with your sisters I have so many questions there. I mean, number one, your sisters and you must just be like so bonded. Like you just must be the very bestest friends in the universe. You know, we're bonded and we are very good friends. But you know, Julie, one of the keys to Satellite Sisters is that we've never all lived in the same place or been in the same room together. And that's what keeps it fresh. Like if we all went to an office together, it probably wouldn't have lasted 20 years, you know? Um, and even when we did the radio show six days a week, we had a rotating cast of sisters. So okay. only three of us would be on at a time. So every day was a different combination. I mean, every day of the week we had a set combination, right. but right. you knew Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, you were going to get this combination, and Friday, you got this combination. And so I think that's what saved us, because we didn't have to be, like, all in each other's hair. 
Uh, I mean, there had to have been times where you've sort of like bickered or had sort of different views on what you guys were talking about or what you were feeling or just oh, outside yeah. family things going on. But you'd yeah. be able to just compartmentalize that and come on the show and all be like cohesive. Yeah, you know, we grew up in an Irish Catholic family where our motto is really suppress and deny. So, uh, well, do you, do you like, so that, um, so yeah, we could do that. <laughs> yep. You're, but that's you're amazing. I mean, your, your parents obviously did some amazing things that you are just so incredibly bonded, right? Yeah, I mean, we actually wrote a whole book about it. Our first Satellite Sisters book was called Satellite Sisters Uncommon Senses. And that came out in 2001. And that was about the lessons we learned growing up in a big family. And so yeah, there are a lot of really important life lessons. Uh, I mean, there are eight of us, there are three right. girls and five boys. So, I mean, sorry, five girls and three boys. Right. And so um, that's, you know, you really, first you learn you're just not the center of the universe. I mean, that's a super important rule to learn. And in a big family, you learn that very, very quickly. And then you learn, no one cares, really, what you, what you did all day or what you got on your math tests or where you're going to college. No one is not that interested. <laughs> not even where you're going to college. It's like, <laughs> good, just go. I mean, it's true. When I, I was number eight and when I went to Pomona here in Claremont, Wait, so California. You were number eight. You're the youngest. Mm -hmm. I'm okay. the youngest. Okay. So when I went, I wasn't even, I graduated early from high school. So I wasn't even living at home when the acceptance letter came. And my parents went, where is this school? What is this? Pomona. Pomona. They didn't even know I had applied there. So, oh. uh, so I'm not kidding, Julie. No one, <laughs> no one cares. And so, it's are a good all, so all the siblings are all over the country or are several yeah. of them in Connecticut where you're from? Some, I mean, my oldest brother just moved from Connecticut. So he was the last one there. People live, um, a lot of people moved west. Uh, my sister Julie, who does the show with us, has lived all over the world. She did the show from Bangkok and Russia, and now she lives in Dallas. I have a sister in the Pacific Northwest. I had two sisters in New York that then moved to Los Angeles when we moved to ABC. So, you know, we, and then I have brothers uh, here and in, in um, the Pacific Northwest. So, but a lot of cousins and yeah, I mean, we're all spread out, but that again, putting the satellite and satellite sisters. But I was telling, I was saying about Helen, it was when we lost our jobs on the radio that all of a sudden I had, was unemployment. And that's when I was like, I guess I'll write that book, Big Helen of Pasadena, because ABC sold off the radio division. And then it was 2008 and the, there was the you know, global economic crisis. And I'm like, well, I guess I have time to write that novel now. So that's, that's when I wrote Helen. But that was a long way around to answer that first question. And did your sisters also get into writing and start writing their own novels? No, they don't write fiction, no. Okay. Okay, yeah. so that was just all you. Okay, so then when you decided that you were going to write it, did you just start writing or did you take some writing classes? Did you have mentors? How did that process begin for you? Well, I had been writing, um, you know, nonfiction stuff. I had had a column in Working Mother magazine for a long time, a humor column called The Chaos Chronicles, uh, right. where it was just about my life as a working mom. And I had written stuff. Our column in O magazine was an advice column, like an etiquette advice column column the old sort of what are we supposed to do then and and be one question and all five of us would answer it but I would pretty much answer wow. for all five sisters and their voices you know uh so, wow. this so you are the writer it, of the family so I you was the, the writer. writer yeah so but and, and I had written everything um I had taken uh screenwriting classes when I first moved to Los Angeles after I got married I had uh, produced in the sport business and and written scripts for um sports stuff uh but with fiction I had not write fi written fiction prose so I did like the day after they told us goodbye, don't come back to do your radio show anymore. Like the next week I signed up for an online writing class because I thought if I don't do something, uh, I am going to sit on this couch in these red sweatpants and just watch Sweet Home Alabama for the rest of my life, which I love that movie. I mean, it's underrated. It's underrated, Julie, it's that movie. It's <laughs> so, so good. So wow. Okay, so you write Helen of Pasadena, and I just have to say thank you so much. That one book 
has really brought an entire community here in Pasadena. And I don't know how the rest of the country perceives it, but I know here in Pasadena, it's like you'll mention authors or books and some people know and some people have a blank look. And then you say Leanne Dolan, <laughs> Helen of Pasadena, and everyone lights up. Whether they've read it or heard about it, everyone knows of your book. And I personally, it came out in 2010, right? Yeah. Yes. And that was just after my third daughter was born. And so I am deep in the woods of three <laughs> girls and diapers and everything. And I think your book was the first book I had re read ever since before I got married, maybe. Oh, <laughs> and wow. It was really just, I, I didn't want it to end. I wouldn't read the last 20 pages forever because oh. I didn't want it to oh. end. It was ridiculous. That's nice. That's a good so, review. It's, uh, it's just, it was so, I think, and I was talking to a friend about this the other day, and I think what's so special about that book is that it's so close to our own lives, right, in the Pasadena area here with the Rose Parade that you bring into the book, and the Huntington Gardens, and then that little love affair that we all sort of just want to get away from our lives, <laughs> <laughs> fantasize about something else. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so that was amazing. And then fast forward to the Sweeney sisters. And I feel like that is kind of similar in the sense that I love how you go so deep into the community. And you're talking about Connecticut and you're talking about your sister who live who who lives in New York City and running around Central Park and all of that stuff just makes me want to read it so slowly to like just go into that world and pretend I'm on the East Coast. Well, I, I believe in giving books a real sense of place. I think that's something I like in fiction. I like to read books uh, where you know where they are and you can feel that. I like to see movies and television shows that have a real sense of place. And when I wrote Helen and Elizabeth, the first wife, the second book, uh, I, you know, I just was surprised that there hadn't actually been a, a lot of fiction set in Pasadena. I thought it had a lot of elements that you see in women's fiction. It has this very traditional core, uh, but then it's a big multicultural population. It has these institutions that are world famous, like the Rose Parade and the, and the Huntington Library. Um, it has an interesting mix of old money and new money and no money. And uh, there are expectations if you live here. And um, I just thought that was a really rich setting for, um, for fiction. You know, I felt like I could do something with that, particularly because I, I didn't grow up here, you know, so I had been kind of looking and observing the social structures for a while. And I, I think when you write your first novel, you know, one of the joys of writing your first novel is you just don't think anyone's going to read it. And I know that's crazy, but like no one's waiting for anyone's first novel, basically. <laughs> it's like a golden rule of fiction. So, um, so there's a real freedom in writing that way. And, you know, I just, I, I would just hold up and I, I wrote the book I wanted to write um, in a year. And, and, you know, I did, uh, it wasn't really till about two or three weeks before the book came out that it occurred to me people were going to read it. I mean, honestly. And then I was like, oh, what if people don't like it? Like that, I, I just hadn't, I just, it all happened pretty quickly. Uh, so, and I was working with a local publisher, Prospect Park Books, who had right. a great marketing plan. And so we, and but had never brought out fiction before. So we were just kind of doing our thing. And then I had to really pause and go, oh, people are going to read it. Oh, shoot. And, um, and I knew like right after New Year's, the book came out in November. And mm -hmm. right after New Year's, I opened my inbox and there were like, 15 invites to speak at the Valley Hunt Club and all these women's organizations, <laughs> junior league. And, and I was like, Oh, phew. Okay. I'll, I'll eat lunch in this town again. That's but, so um, exciting. How amazing. People like reading about themselves. You know, I was really struck by that. How, I mean, to me, it was really fiction. I didn't grow up here. So the mod, the people I wrote about in that book to me, were characters created from my past, not necessarily here. There was a whole generation of people in Pasadena. I didn't know. I didn't grow. I didn't know people's mothers. I didn't. I didn't have any sense of that. I don't belong to any clubs because I had been working six days a week. I 
I wasn't on any committees. Like I did a little volunteer work at my son's school, but I'm not, I was not well connected. Uh, and I, but I have been observing. And I think a lot of it is because Pasadena is a lot like Connecticut. Uh, right. So, and, right. I mean, Very similar towns. I kind of joke that it's, you know, Connecticut with palm trees. So, uh, <laughs> So, more sunshine no snow yeah yeah so um so that's why the sweeney sisters is is set in my hometown the town i actually grew up in southport connecticut which is a small uh seaside town it's absolutely charming about 45 minutes outside of new york so you know a lot of people in town get on the train and take it into the city and work there all day and and get back uh you know come back home and uh and but it's a much smaller town than Pasadena and it's a much more homogenous town than Pasadena. And, you know, it really was like burned in the revolutionary war. And so, it, so only a few houses remain pre-revolution uh, and they were Tory houses, you know? So, and oh my God, she, you know, and people really were daughters of the American revolution there. Like right. they're not kidding. So I thought, well, you know, that's a good setting for this particular story in the Sweeney Sisters, where it's kind of like family secrets unfolding and stuff that's happening behind these, you know, perfect facades, these beautiful houses. Exactly. And you can write to that so well, because it was your experience growing up. Mm -hmm. And you, you can just so vividly paint the picture for us of exactly what it would be like to live there, which, as you said, it just makes the story come to life so much more. Um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see if people like it. I, oh, I'm I starting think so. The to cover have alone, everybody will be reading it. It reminds me of, I love how it's whimsical. It's like part whimsical, part classic. And it feels like Little Women, but uh, like hip version. <laughs> These are some big words you're using, actually. <laughs> no, but what I love. Little Women, that's. Well, yeah, well, um, you know, it's a group of sisters. Oh, I know you yes. have character cards. Uh, I, I had to print this out and put it up here because I got this off of your Instagram page. And I just love, this is so beautiful. And it so quickly depicts the four main characters in your book, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, you know what, one of the, the, the things I like to do the most is create characters. And so it's really, I mean, that's, a, that's the really fun work of writing, you know, before you actually have to start writing. Uh, you have to sort of populate your story and, and that's where you can really put whoever you want in. It's yours, right. you can make it up. Uh, right. And that's the whole point of fiction. And so I did like creating the sister characters. I mean, it's certainly a, a milieu I know well. And, um, but none of those are exact. Are They're like, those are not my sisters. Right. They may be well, somebody's sisters. Have. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, They're when your own sisters read the book, were they like, oh, that one's me? Or are you talking about me here? Or was no. there none of that? You know, there's not, I mean, first of all, only two of my four have read the book uh, and that's by design. I mean, right. my, two, my other two sisters want to, they want to buy it. Uh, there are no free copies. First of all, let's be very clear in our family. They know the rules. Everyone pays. Uh, right. And, um, and, and they're not fiction writers. So getting their notes beforehand is not that helpful. I, I have readers that work I work with or right. we read each other's stuff. I get notes. That's helpful. Um, so uh, two of my sisters are going to buy it when it comes out and then two read it and I warned them all. Uh, I said, listen, every bad thing we've ever done is in this book, but it's all mixed up. So don't worry. <laughs> no, no, nobody's going to know who did what. Good to know. So every bad thing in the book is actually reality. It's happened in one way or another. I mean, maybe. I don't know. Maybe. Again, it's right. it's fiction. It happened in some form. You know, I mean, yeah, people, yeah, right. kids make mistakes. And there's their, you know, certainly the characters in the book have, you know, they're flawed. They're, right. they're real because they're flawed. Right. right. Of course. But, but you are the youngest daughter in your actual family. So then we can assume you must be most like Trisha Sweeney. <laughs> See, again, this is the point to point comparison that like leaves no room for the fiction piece of writing. All right. That's, that's the gap. I mean, uh, there's part of, I mean, I, I'm sympathetic to younger 
youngest children. I think we've been misrepresented in literature and television for centuries. Uh, most of us aren't babies. We're not whiny. Uh, you know, most of us have just raised ourselves and uh, we're fine with that. So that is very true. I definitely <laughs> see that with my youngest daughter. But yeah. I'm sure her older sisters don't see that at all. Yeah. And they, well, because they don't see her at all. Take it from right. me. They are not looking at her. I, I, I guarantee that. That's it's not, perspective. It's whatever, they don't care. Oh, they don't care. Um, but I, I mean, Trisha in the book is like a super competitive, determined runner, and she's a lawyer, and I'm just none of those things. I mean, I'm, I'm competitive, but I have no talent. Uh, so, oh, so, but um, you have talent for writing and for doing an amazing podcast that's but, played but, for 20 years. But not athletic talent. So uh, I'm just a very mediocre athlete. And um, so that's... So there's there's nothing sort of about her personality that's like mine, but the idea that she sort of is one that's kind of a take charge younger sister, that's probably, you know, the, the, my sisters would characterize me as that. But um, but it, it really, if, if you try to recreate real people, it just doesn't work. It's you need the characters to serve the story. You know, so you need them to have characteristics that propel the plot forward. And, and that's, that's something you learn, you learn a little bit more with every book that, you know, the characters serve the story and the story serves the characters. And that's, you just need to sort of start from that place. So even if you have this tiny idea, like, oh, they're, you know, they're all gonna have gone to summer camp, which a lot of us went to summer camp. Like right. then it just explodes from there. It's not like okay, now I need to to um, to really recreate our summer camp experience. Like it just doesn't work. It's it that's a drag. That's harder to do, and that's uh, why about with Helen of Pasadena, mm -hmm. I laughed when people um, thought the schools were like a hundred percent based on real schools. Uh, that book has a you know plot line about uh, you know high school admission and right. admission and private I mean, I, honestly, Julie, it took me like 30 seconds to name the schools. When I sort of wrote the opening paragraph about the school, I, 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 just, I just, in my mind, it was so clearly an amalgam and, you know, misconceptions and rumors and right. fake and real. And I, I, and so when I would go to book clubs and people would have the maps on the wall of like Pasadena and the schools, I was like, this is not how fiction works. This is... <laughs> This is not, this is not how it works. Hi. Interesting. Wow. So, so it's just like, it came to you because of your life experiences with Helen of Pasadena. And then when you went to write Elizabeth, the first wife, did that just flow as easily? Did, did all three of your books sort of just flow out of you? And did they all take about the same time to write? Or between them, was it sometimes harder? Um, I have never had the experience where things have flowed out of me. I, I've never had that. I keep waiting for that to happen. When people tell me, oh, I wrote a first draft in six months or, or in three months, I'm like, there's no way I could do that. Um, I, I am a, an outliner and a plotter and I, um, you know, I like to... I like to have a lot of the story in place before I start. If it requires research, uh, I do enough so I can start, but not so much that I get bogged down in research. And Helen had a little history. Elizabeth, the first wife, had a lot of Shakespeare. I've written another book that is not out yet, but it's done. And that's an art history mystery and that had a lot of um, research. So, uh, so, and then you got to sit down and you have to write 100,000 words, which just physically takes me a long time. I find fiction writing exhausting. So, but you know, most of the books, except for the art history mystery, which took me like four years to write, the other three took about a year, you know, start to finish uh, about, a, about a year of, you know, really focused work. So and when you say really focused work, does that mean you go into your office every day, same time and decide to spend a certain amount of hours writing? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I am um, pretty good about compartmentalizing my work because I do a bunch of different things. Um, okay. So like the podcast and then I write fiction, but then I also write the Pasadena Magazine column, which is nonfiction. That's different. Um, so I, I have to be 
pretty disciplined about my time. And um, I find it's easier for me to just kind of batch produce stuff. So Monday, Tuesdays, I work on the podcast and uh, I don't worry about the fiction. That would be too much. I cannot switch back and forth between fiction and producing. I can't do that. Um, uh, so, um, and then we record our podcast Tuesday, it gets posted, blah, blah, blah. And like with the Sweeney sisters, I was on a pretty tight deadline. I had, I did have to turn the first draft in in about seven months. Um, I wrote, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So I work seven days a week for that, um, that time period. And I usually, you know, I'm a morning person and a better morning writer. Um, and so I usually work. I get up, have coffee, walk the dog, sit down. So I'll usually work from eight to one, uh, nine to two wow. on, on, on fiction, on writing. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that works for me. Right. Other people are like hodgepodgey and I, yeah. I just, yeah. I'm a working mom. I always needed structure. I needed to get right. stuff done before the kids right. got home. I need exactly. quiet. I need quiet in the house when I write fiction. So all that stuff means, you know, I have to work sort of school hours and things like that. Hi. Oh, was, the was the cover your design? Was that your oh, idea? No. Okay. No, no. You don't get, um, you, authors rarely get any cover input. I mean, you, you can say yay or mm, uh, maybe some don't get any. So I feel very lucky. Uh, um, was that the first version when they showed no. you? No. Were you like, yes? No, the first version was the first version that was completely approved and we thought we were going with it was sort of a preppy like it was sailboats and it's kind of said Connecticut shoreline and I liked it. I don't consider myself a very visual person. Um, like I, I don't I, I, I don't I don't craft I don't paint I don't have any talent in that area like I look at stuff and go that's nice you know but I, I really let the experts take care of the yeah. visuals, it's not me. So sure, the designers, the art directors, the editors, they know what sells. So they, we all liked the sailboats, I liked it. And then about three weeks later, um, I got a call from my editor and she said, you know what? Uh, we love this book and we don't love this cover. And the, so I went out and I found an artist I've always wanted to work with. And then she sent me the cover. And of course I, I was happy. I mean, this sounds so Pasadena. I was at Rancho La Puerta. I was at a spa in Mexico where, I, where there's no Wi-Fi. There's like nothing. The whole oh point God. is that you disconnect. And I was like running around Rancho La Puerta trying to connect so I could approve the cover. <laughs> kind of like we were trying to do earlier today. Yes. I was like five days. It was like five. I was trying to get away for five days. And in the middle of it, I got this beautiful cover. And I just, I literally, tears came to my eyes. I was like, oh my gosh, this is unbelievable. So, oh, so I. So, so lovely. Yeah. yeah. Special. Amazing. Love it so much. So excited that it's coming out on Tuesday. People can start pre-ordering now. They right. Been able to, but it'll be ready to be put in your hands after Tuesday, and they should go to bookshop.org, right, which is sort of set up to also help give part of the proceeds to Romans and Pasadena and other outlets. Is that right? Yeah, independent booksellers. It's relatively new. Um, you know, this is really an unprecedented time, of course, for everybody and for the book business uh, to have all of these bookstores shuttered has been tough. And many of them really didn't have online components because, you know, there's that other company, Amazon, that yeah. kind of does all the online books. So, uh, yeah. so this is a consortium of independent bookstores that are working together together and uh and a portion of the proceeds you can pick which indie bookstore uh gets your get your portion uh, at bookshop.org and you know are they delivering pretty quick because i know my daughter was trying to order a book on amazon and it said it would take about 30 days um at bookshop.org is that's why i'm sending people there because they're not supplying medical supplies um okay. amazon yeah oh right they're supplying everything toilet yeah. paper all the essentials I so yeah, that again, that was a surprise when when people started getting letters saying, "Oh, the book will not be in your you know mailbox." But I think even Amazon is shipping. Um, according again, I don't. There's no Amazon there. There's no there there. There's no one you can talk to. So uh, right, right. So they're shipping and you and but Bookshop.org is a great place to go. 
What about, will this also be on Audible? From the yeah, book? for okay. the first time, it's an, I have an audio book. I did not have audio books of my previous books, um, right. but Harper, I'm at a new publisher, Harper Collins, and they have an audio division. So I've only heard the first chapter, which was pretty thrilling. I did get to pick the voice. Congratulations. Yeah, I did get so to exciting. pick, you know, they asked me if I wanted to read it. I mean, they didn't really want me to, but it was in my contract. And I was like, please don't make me read my own book. I, I'm not an actress. I, I don't want to. Uh-oh, you froze. Oh, there you are. Oh, I'm, I think I'm running out of battery. This has oh, been such okay. an insane well, day. Then, well, then we should let you go. It's been Thanks, so much Joy. fun. Thank you for doubling back. You. I just you. have one more quick question. And that is, is there anything you've been doing in quarantine that is new, that you always wanted to try, that you never got to, anything? Um, you know, I take a lot of dance classes and I actually dance with like a middle-aged lady dance troupe. <laughs> so, um, this it's is super why cool. I asked because I wanted to know something different and interesting. It was super cool. And uh, it's really fun. We actually like even perform on stage and stuff. It's not just a Zumba class. It's like choreography and ballroom and hip hop and Broadway and jazz. And then we get, you know, we're on stage and it's crazy. And I really, we had our big show March 4th and then kind of the window came down on everything. So we have been, you know, doing all the Zoom dance classes and I've been taking private dance lessons. Online? Zoom. You've been taking private dance lessons with my, with Yes, with the teacher. He Zooms in and I'm like in the living room. And um, what I found, and I'm doing the same with my yoga house uh, teacher at, online. I find these, um, there are a lot of people offering classes, but I just right. really find the familiar voices super comforting. I the connection, like I, I tried a couple of with people I don't know and I'm like, I love to support my teachers in this. I love to support these people who are right. doing their own thing. And uh, so that's it. So I've been ballroom dancing in my living room, which is really confusing the dog. <laughs> Well, no, wait, so your husband must join you, right? He, he no. wants to. <laughs> no, no, my partner is the teacher. My partner oh, is the teacher. So you're like holding your phone. And I'm you're exactly, saying? well, it's on, the, I have the laptop set up and I'm trying and it's complicated and I'm learning a Roomba and that's hard to do. There's a lot of hip action, Julie. And, um, How and, fun. And he can so see. Really yeah. busy in quarantine. You are like doing your thing. I, I'm doing my thing. I feel lucky to be safe at home. Right. I feel lucky to live in a place like California where we have great leadership and great weather and I can work out in my garden and I can walk the dog and then I can just stay at home and do what I need to do. So I feel lucky. So amazing. So good to be with you. Everyone go out and buy the Sweeney Sisters. Thank you.